see the world through other people's eyes. Now, empathy is a quality of character that can change the world. Hi, it's Edwin Rutsch from the Center for Building a Culture of Empathy. And today I'm uh, glad to have uh, Mary McKenzie here uh, visiting uh, to talk about how we can build a culture of empathy. Thank you for joining me today. Thank you, Edwin. I'm glad to be here. Yeah, we had a little bit of problems getting Skype working, but we're all set now. So I'm <laughs> glad we can get started. Um, so you are, I have some just information here about you that you're a, a nonviolent uh, communication certified trainer and director of the Peace Workshop International. Is that correct? Yeah. Yes, I am. And um, I also have uh, some your Facebook page up here. Some of y'all just show that and a little bit about you. So uh, we have your Facebook page, a nice picture of you next to uh, in nature and and uh, near a little uh, pond or maybe a lake. And uh, you're also uh, the, the uh, co-founder of the NVC Academy. And I have that uh, picture up here of your website at nvctraining.com. Mm -hmm. And also let's bring up your book, uh, Peaceful Living, uh, uh, Daily Meditations for Living with Love, Healing and Compassion. So that's just, would you like to uh, say anything, introduce yourself a little bit more, something more about yourself? Oh, no, just, I think that's all true, what you've said about me. And um, I, I guess you could say I do work in a variety of areas. And so I have, you know, two companies where my work flows through and I, I teach NVC and sort of all aspects of that. Well, the NVC Academy, that's uh, like an online training, uh, and you have like a lot of trainers there on your site. seems like all the big trainers are, are mm -hmm. take part in that. Yeah, the NVC Academy was founded by my business partner, Mark Schultz, and I in 2006, July of 2006. And we had a dream at that time to support people who wanted to learn NVC and also support trainers who wanted to offer NVC to people. And so it's an online company and people can take webinars or telecourses from the comfort and ease of home or their business office from 40 plus trainers all around the world. And we usually have between, I don't know, five to 10 telecourses or webinars offered at one time. And then last year, we launched a program that we're really excited about, which is the NVC Multimedia Library. And that library is a collection of NVC resources like audio and video recordings of trainings from trainers all around the world, articles from trainers, uh, training tips, tips for living NVC, online courses. All of, all of it is online and available to our subscribers 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And currently we have about 250 resources in the library and it grows every day. And we are continuing to grow it and it's a wonderful resource. I mean, really, it's a wonderful resource. Yeah, it looks great. I mean, I've just kind of perused it and you have mm -hmm. kind of information about all the trainers and uh I haven't taken part in it, but it, I think online training is a great way to go and I think really the future. So, Yeah, I just want to say about the trainers, we have um, some of the most sought after trainers in the world have resources in our library. And I'll just give you a couple of examples about how I like to use the library. If I'm going to be tr doing a training and maybe it's on something that I've done a bunch of times already like empathy or self-empathy, so I'll go into the library and do a search on those processes just to see what are other trainers doing, just to get some training tips for what would be a different activity I could use in my group that's coming up. I also use it as a way to be inspired on a daily basis to remind myself about NVC. And actually, that's why I wrote the book, Peaceful Living, initially, which is a meditation book, a daily meditation book for living nonviolent communication. And secondly, why I think the library is powerful. Because I think for a lot of us, between our face-to-face -face trainings, it's nice to have a little inspiration here and there to help us get through a day. 
Um, I have lots of clients who use the library when they're, um, when they're, maybe they've had an argument with somebody and they're not as centered as they want. They go into the library, they do a search on what to do when you're angry, and they get some inspiration that way. Uh, people can do searches on parenting, any NVC process. You can search by trainer. You can search by skill level, introductory, intermediate, and advanced, and beginner, actually. So there's a variety of ways that you can use the library. And I would suggest it for anybody. I think it's really powerful. Yeah. So what we wanted to talk about uh, is how we can go about building a culture of empathy, or at least that's kind of how I kind of frame this uh, uh, discussion. And I find it just helpful to start with the metaphor of empathy. Like the empathy is often, uh, the definition of empathy is the, the, the metaphor of standing in someone else's shoes and looking through someone else's eyes. And for me, empathy is like a cornucopia. And so, and I ask people, well, tell me about what your metaphor for empathy is. And everybody has a different one if they're not using, you know, the standard uh, definition. Uh, do you have a metaphor of what empathy is like to you? How I talk about empathy is very similar to what I heard Marshall say one time, that empathy, empathy is for me a presence that allows me to stand in somebody else's shoes and try to understand the world from their perspective. And then secondly, NVC offers us a tool of empathy, which is we call empathy, which is a way of letting the other person know that they've been heard, that I've heard them. It's something to say that lets them know that I've heard them. That's how I think about oh, empathy. Okay, well, uh, you know, Marshall has a metaphor of empathy. He says empathy is like surfing. I don't know if you've yes. heard that metaphor. And, I have. Uh, that metaphor, empathy is like surfing, and the idea there is, when you're surfing on the wave, you're always having to be bodily aware of what's going on with the wave. You're kind of in communication. You're present with the wave. You know, if, the, yeah. you know, if it's going fast, you got to do this. If it's going slow, you got to do that. And so I yeah. think that's a nice metaphor. So I'll tell you what my newest one is uh, about this is um, empathy is to me like um, driving a manual transmission in your car. So before you click into gear, you can grind the gears a little bit. It can make a loud noise. It can be really uncomfortable. And when you've connected with somebody, you have that moment when you really understand them and they've been heard. It's like the gear slipping right in. Mm. It found its spot and it goes kerchink. And the car runs smoothly. In a relationship, the relationship runs smoothly because we're in alignment. We found our spot the sweet spot, which is about connecting to the life in the other person. So, and when we do that, we get to connect to our own life. I'm complete. Mm, oh, yeah, that's, that's a beautiful uh, metaphor. I love that. The, uh, so it's uh, when we're kind of in dialogue, maybe things aren't working. It's the gears are grinding a little bit. There's a little, you know, there's not. But then when we connect, they, they were just slip into gear and there's like this harmonious connection that kind of happens. Yeah. And they're grinding before because you're, they're trying to find their spot. They're trying to find that sweet spot. And in an argument, we're trying to find that connection, but we're not there yet. And empathy allows us to find the spot. And what does that uh, feel like as a bodily sensation? If you had to describe it as <laughs> the physical sensation of that happening, uh, what would that be like? Of what happening, of the empathy? Of oh, the, the empathy, part? the grinding and the connection. What is that? You know, I mean, I yeah. can kind of hear, I, I mean, <laughs> you know, when, when I was learning to do stick shift, right? I remember yeah. it was a truck and it was so <laughs> embarrassing. <laughs> remember, yeah. It's like, you know, I was with somebody and said, oh, you just go ahead and try. And then I kind of shifted into gear and I didn't know how to give the right amount of gas. And the, the truck was lurching back and forth. And it was exactly. it was like a, a horror memory that, you know, that I, I just think back. <laughs> of, oh, this is so embarrassing. And there was this uh, woman crossing the road. And she looked at me and was like, oh, my God. <laughs> so, <laughs> I still remember that. So, what was, yeah. and so it was like a, a horrible sensation, painful, embarrassing, and and uh, and uh, so that's the I would say that's what when the gears aren't uh, working properly um, for me, uh, you know, that's the that's the felt sensation. So I'm just wondering, what is it for you, and what does it feel like when the gears slip, you know, smoothly together? Okay, well, um, 
just to continue on with what you were just talking about, the other thing that happens with the manual transmission is if you're trying to go up a hill, you're trying to start up a hill, and you don't have the brake and the transmission and the and the gear shift going together, you'll roll backwards. That's how it feels in a relationship, like you're not getting anywhere. You're going backwards. Sometimes I think we actually panic when we're in that moment mm. and we start to tell ourselves it's not going to happen. Nothing is going to make this shift. This is impossible. We probably start judging the other person or ourselves or maybe going back and forth. You know, the other person is a jerk. They can't, they can't do this. They don't have what it takes to connect. I don't have what it takes to connect. And so the feeling is panic, I think. And I think we feel it in our gut and I think we feel it in our head. And um, it's painful. There's that moment where we think we're lost. And then when we find the gear, it's instant gratification in that moment. It's like, it's like going, oh, that's it. Right. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. I had this old car uh, when I was a kid, when I first got my license. It was a beat up old car. And it had the um, stick shift on the column. Oh, yeah. And I got to the point where I could, um, I, could, I could shift gears without using the clutch. And so there was something about really being in the feel of the car. And just at the right moment, I could feel it and I could just shift the gear without using the clutch at all. That's what I want in my relationships, mm. that kind of grace. Well, that's kind of like an individual, as an individual driver kind of metaphor of empathy. Like what I'm looking at, I, I think is that's part of it. But what about like a whole culture? Is it like we're all driving around, you know, with stick shifts and it's like a big mess? And, you know, what is a culture of empathy, a whole culture where, uh, you know, what is that metaphor? What does that look like? Hmm. I think how, how I would say it is it's sort of like... Um, we are all driving cars. We all are out there and we're trying to find a flow. So how can I, how can I be in that flow, in somebody else's flow and mine at the same time? How can I share the road with that person and me at the same time? How can I have some compassion for the person who's on the road, maybe running backwards down a hill or doing what you were doing down the road, you know, lurching forward? How can I be in that space that actually contributes to the flow of empathy, even if all those other people aren't in the flow, mm. that they're, find, they're trying to find it, or maybe they can't find it, or maybe they've been looking for it for years, or maybe they don't even know that they want it. How can I, ne anyways, infuse a situation with more love, more grace, more uh, compassion? And I think we forget that. I think we forget that we have a powerful influence on the level of intimacy and compassion that's in our world. We think that what we do in our little world is insignificant. And I say it's not. It is actually the significance. Mm. Yeah, if, if we're driving harmoniously down the street, we're being a good example maybe and be letting other people feel calmer too or something like that. We're actually infusing the situation with more love and compassion, mm -hmm. regardless of how it... it it affects other people. I'll give you a concrete example. Um, one time years ago, I, I went into a store that I know really well. It was just down the street from where I lived. And there were these three young men in the store. And I tell you, it's the first time this has happened, but I felt terror. I felt absolute terror. And the hair on the back of my neck went up. And I thought, I've got to get out of here. This is a dangerous place to be. And... Um, but there was one of, one of them were out, was outside, um, and their car was parked next to mine. And so I was standing there trying to decide what is the safest thing to do here. And I decided to stay in the store because I knew the store manager very well, and I thought that was the safer place to be. So I did my business. I got in my car, and I happened to leave just after them. And I was thinking, these guys are scary. These guys are dangerous. And then I noticed it, and I thought, I don't want to infuse more hate and anger into the situation. So while I was following them down the road, I literally was praying for them and all the people who come in contact with them and all the people who have ever come in contact with them and all the pain that they've ever had, and I was empathizing for them. And to me, this is about infusing it with love, not adding more hate, more judgment, 
more separation to the situation. So does that make sense? Yeah, what I'm it's saying? like uh, you had like a fear and an anxiety and within yourself. And it's like you went to that and, and said, I'm going to transform this. I'm going to be present with the fear, with the anxiety and bring my empathy and compassion to that. Exactly. And it may not do anything different for them, but it's a, it's a, an, a conscious act to infuse more love and compassion to a situation rather than infusing it with more judgment, blame, hate, and fear. Yeah. And then that, I think that's that, powerful. Yeah. And it, that sends out uh, waves, that energetic waves throughout yes. society. And, that's, and people pick up on that in subtle, subtle ways. Yeah. Mm. And I hear a lot of people say, there's nothing I can do. And so I think there's a lot we can do. We have a lot, a lot more power than we give ourselves credit for. Yeah. Well, uh, one question I've been asking people is like, when is the first time that you kind of felt the power of empathy? Was there, do you have some kind of a story, some kind of a moment where you said, hey, this is, empathy is pretty good stuff. You know, I really want to do this more. Or was it kind of more like a gradual, you know, kind of learning about empathy? Hmm. Let me just think for a minute. I guess I don't have a specific situation, but what I remember, I have a vague memory of a time when I was angry and somebody, rather than moving out of the relationship by having more blame for me, they moved in and they gave me empathy. And it transformed my anger in a moment, just a heartbeat. And um, and it literally almost took my breath away to have to have somebody do that. And um, I believe that's when I was utterly hooked. That's when I got the real intimacy and the real um, magic of empathy between people and how it can feel to be on the other side of that when there's somebody who actually is standing with you and and sincerely trying to understand who you are even if you're expressing yourself in a way that's hard to take in what was the situation was it you're with a friend and you're having some kind of conflict or yeah i don't remember it anymore it's oh. like a vague memory that i'm pulling out actually i don't have any more specifics about it well i have one uh, yeah, for me empathy has been kind of a, a slower you know kind of bit by bit uh learning about it and and so it wasn't, I mean, some people I've asked, they've had like this one, you know, inspirational moment of, of empathy and it's like changed their life or something. For, for me, it's been slower. But one experience I did have is I was trying to ex express something to someone. It was like so frustrating. I couldn't feel, uh, you know, I, I, I could just feel kind of stressed about them not kind of getting or understanding what I was trying to say. And then I actually asked for a reflection I said, will you just reflect back what you're hearing me me uh, say? And the person said, well, you're saying this and this and this. And it was almost like a flood. I could feel kind of my emotions flooding out. And I felt, uh, you know, I felt like heard. I felt connected. And I felt uh, like we we're kind of in the, an embrace almost. It was like a, mm -hmm. an emotional embrace with this person that I was you know, I was in connection with them. So for me, that was like mm. one little bit of just learning, hey, I can actually ask for someone to empathize and reflect to me. Mm. Lovely. I like hearing that. So um, I guess we, unless you have something to like add to any, any stories, but uh, so what can we do now if we're here in this situation we have the, in society, you know, we have all these drivers or, you know, grinding the gears, you know, we, we see it, we see it in the government, we see it in, you know, in, in crime, we see, I mean, it's just like so many social problems and wars and what have you. And it, it's really like people are just grinding the gears. And so yeah. how do we move society, uh, you know, from that to, you know, this, this, uh, this, this empathic connection? Yeah. What ideas do you have about that? For me, the most important thing is developing a self-empathy practice. I think a lot of us look outside of ourselves. We want other people to be peaceful. We want them to bring it to us. 
And we want it from our ministers and our political leaders and our partners and our family and our bosses. We want other people to develop it. And oftentimes people become activists because they want to activate other people into having an empathic consciousness. And my message is that it's for each of us as individuals to develop that. And again, by doing that, then we infuse that into our world. So to me, developing a a self-empathy practice that helps you heal some of your old junk that you bring into every conversation, every relationship, to um, stay connected and present with yourself is a first really important step. My work is mostly about um, bringing practical NVC tools into our own life. And so the first step for me is developing a really positive, practical self-empathy practice. The second, I think, is about um, developing a meditation practice. Because really part of what is, uh, creates empathy between people is remembering the divinity in the other person and ourselves. When we remember that, we, we simply can't do harm to other people. I really think it's impossible to hold even judgment and a true empathic presence. And judgment is to me always the start of violence, always. So the more we meditate and develop uh, inner presence, inner clarity, remind ourselves of our true divine presence, the more likely we are to um, inject empathy into our world. So you're, you're just, so the first step you're saying is to have an actual practice and uh, an actual self-empathy, a self-empathy practice. empathy practice. And what does that look like for you in, a, in the day? I mean, as you go through your day, what are you, what are you doing for this practice? I have a variety of self-empathy tools that I use. Um, I developed a process called the RAP, which is a longer self-empathy process, and I, um, I do that several times a week. And in addition to that, I have a couple of more simple self-empathy methods that I use on the fly, uh, you know, throughout the day. Um, some practical ways I do this is, in the, you know, in the middle of the day, if I start to feel tired, I give myself a few moments of empathy literally sitting at my desk I'll just check in so um, there are a lot of physical signs that alert us that we're not connected to our to our um, hearts or to our divine self one of them is we start to feel tired so connecting to our needs can help us wake up have more energy anytime we have a judgment or we're noticing judgment about another person or ourselves it's a sign that we're not connected we're not in empathy Anytime we feel fear, it's a sign of that. Um, For myself, I have a lot of tasks in my day. Mm. So if I notice myself feeling grumpy or um, impatient, it's a sign to just stop and connect in. So it used to be that these uh, uh, individual self-empathy moments lasted longer. Now they're really quick. It literally can be I can just sit there and think, yeah, I'm grumpy. What's going on? Yeah, I have a need for more flow and fun in my work. Right now I'm doing more tasks, so what do I want to do about that? Maybe I'll just take a five-minute break. Maybe I'll just walk down the street, do a little business outside uh, with a couple of vendors down the street from me, and then be out in the sun and then come back. So that's what it looks like for me in a practical way. So you've got these uh, kind of uh, techniques, processes that you just kind of do during the day uh, in response or or whatever to different stimuli, like... Say, oh, I'm feeling a little stressed right now. I'm going to stop, just breathe a little deeply, kind of let that go or something like that. Or Exactly. Uh, and, and it's a practice because it's so much a part of my daily flow mm-hmm. that it's not a thing I think about anymore. Um, it's a thing that was developed over several years. Mm-hmm. So it, it's not like you say, well, the first thing I do waking up, you know, I do 20 minutes yeah. of, of some kind of a process. It's more like it looks like it's kind of like woven throughout your day. Yeah, Maybe. the self-empathy yeah. process mm-hmm. is. I do start every morning with um, a meditation. Mm-hmm. So that to me is separate. That That is a thing that I consciously um, do every day, every morning when I wake up. 
Well, another, uh, I asked you this question before about how do we build a culture of empathy? One part you said is to make a commitment. Is there something about being committed to it or? Yes, I think that, um, I think a lot of us, uh, you know, we have a habit of having an ideal to live peacefully in the world or to be empathic. But then something happens. You know, the grocery clerk takes a little bit longer than we like. You know, our mother calls us four times that week, and each time we've told her we're really busy and we'll call later, um, but she keeps calling us. Or somebody says something or does something we don't like. Somebody cuts in front of us with their car, cuts into our lane. Um, maybe our checkbook is lower than, doesn't have as much money in it that we want. So we have a tendency, I think, to do those little moments of just snapping at somebody or being impatient having some sense of righteousness about it. Like, I'm doing this because you're, going, you're the grocery clerk and you're too slow. Or I'm doing this because you're being disrespectful. And so to me, the commitment is really showing up, honoring your commitment to be empathic in the world, to infuse the world with more compassion. And it's not to say that we do it perfectly. I don't mean that. But I mean being really committed. And, um, and then... At the times when you didn't show up in a way you maybe wanted to, or I show up in a way I didn't want to, at that moment give myself empathy. So I'm still infusing the situation with more empathy and compassion for myself and for the other person who maybe was on the other side of my behavior. I tell you what, Edwin, uh, not too long ago I, was, uh, I went to a park here in Long Beach, California. And I was sitting in the park and I was thinking about all the huge transition in my life. And, um, and I started looking around and thinking about my clients. And I came up with this hypothesis that four out of five people in the world right now are in huge life transition. And I really believe that, huge life transi consciousness transition. And I started looking at the actual people that were passing me. And I started counting them out. These four people maybe are having a huge life transition. And I really became awed by it. All the transition in our world right now. And um, again, I wanted to take a conscious, some kind of conscious act in that moment to acknowledge all the people who are passing me, who might be in a lot of pain, who might be in a lot of fear, who might be in a, uh, you know, a big life transition. And so I did a simple thing. I started to smile and say hello in a much more obvious way. So that's what I mean about being committed, really Committing to your practice and understanding the power that we have to create more compassion in our world. For willing to look outside ourselves and acknowledge that other people might be having a similar experience and go out of our way to, to be in that. Well, when I, as I look at the how do we build a culture of empathy and compassion, is I, I wonder about the intention of how do we come to that intention? You know, we... You, know, you have to kind of come to say, hey, this is really something that I want to do. And, I, and then there's like that layer of I'm going to be committed to this. This is really <laughs> what I want to do. And yeah. you know, how do you know, how do you people come or how did you come to have that such a deep uh, intention to want to do it? What is it? The, the energy, the experience that kind of led you to want to do that? Yeah, I really like the question because I think a lot of us have the desire but we don't know how. So what nonviolent communication brought into my life was, were specific tools for how to be more compassionate in my world. Because prior to that, I did want it, but I didn't think I could have it. I didn't think I was compassionate. I actually would tell people, I don't have a compassionate bone in my body. It was only that I didn't know how to access it. And NVC taught me how to access it. So... I would say that how, how to get there is to practice the three tools of nonviolent communication, which are self-empathy, empathy, and expression. And um, as tr fellow trainers and um, in my, uh, as a trainer of this process and to other trainers and other people who want to share it, I say, de again, develop your own, your own skills and living the process. And I think it comes automatically. And I think we then infuse that in our world and people around us, they see what we have and they, they maybe don't know what it is, but they want it. 
and they ask us how, how we got it, and we, we can start telling them some of the tools that we learned with nonviolent communication. I think our world is hungry for tools for living compassionately. I think we're just desperate for it, actually. But if you don't think that you have a role in it, if you don't think that you can actually do anything to make it different, to make it better, people feel hopeless and they stop trying. And they become resigned to experiencing life the way other people told them it had to be experienced. So teaching people how to do it. One of the greatest compliments I get in my workshop is when somebody says, I I watch you and I think I can have that. I can do that. It's not about people thinking I'm great. It's about helping them see the accessibility of living this way and the possibility in their lives. Yeah, so it's like I see that part about the tools, you know, that uh, it's like it's like you could, there's even a, a deeper quality that I'm looking uh, for is like what is there's like some kind of an emotional felt experience of that's going to want. I mean, for me, you know, I, t- I, I mentioned that story about asking for empathy and then it was that that moment of of connection that happened in these, this door kind of opening and feeling that embrace with that person that I mentioned. So it was like this, this warmth, this uh, ease, this, uh, you know, all the, this lovely feeling. It's like, Hey, this feels pretty good. This is so much better than feeling stressed and, and, you know, the gears grinding. So I think it is kind of, it's that, that felt experience that is, that is the underlying, uh, I guess the intention that we get, you know, that it's like, you know, I want more of this experience. I want to be in this, this way. And so that's the best I've come up with that it's, you know, underlying And Then it sounds like you've got the tools. It's like, okay, well, how do I keep and develop this, this, this connection, this feeling? And then you're saying, well, here are all these tools that we've got, you know, that these are the nonviolent communication, the self empathy, the meditation, so you need to be able to do the nuts and bolts of doing it within the society and, and that we live in. Well, I can tell you that as a trainer, one of my training methods is to bring people through a process, no matter what the topic is actually, but bring people through a process where they first of all identify and relate to whatever their pain is or their discontent in their life. And then a process uh, through NVC where they can experience that moment of peace, even just a subtle amount of relief, and then to bring it to their attention. At that moment, to have them identify in their body, how do they feel that? What is it like? That, to me, is giving them a taste of what you're talking about. And it's receiving that taste that makes them want more, that made me want more. And there's even a point, I think, in... um, developing one's uh, ability to live in NVC where the taste of it is so strong and it's frustrating in a way because we, we develop the desire, but we haven't yet developed the skills. And that to me is a sweet spot because that to me is when people want to keep coming back and develop, not necessarily to my trainings or any trainings, I don't mean that, but they want to develop their skill so that they can actually be a person who creates that more in their life. Well, it takes us back to the metaphor of of yeah. the gear grinding is the pain and the you know the the you know yeah. all those those problems that we have in life and it's painful and it is uh, you know we kind of want to get to where we can kind of smoothly you know shift into gear and you know it has this more pleasant feeling and and. Uh, that it's just maybe just like driving a car, that there are skills to be learned. Yeah, and the more that we model it, again, the more people look upon us and say, what do you have? I want that. How would you get there? Yeah, how are you? But I think it really does come from modeling it. Yeah, like how, how are you driving so smoothly? You know, <laughs> exactly. I want to drive like you. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Well, you know, what you've been talking about has been a lot about uh, kind of a self empathy. And uh, you're saying don't look out, you know, for others. 
But for me, it's like there is a component, a social component to empathy in the sense that social structures can foster empathy or, or restrict it. So for example, you can go into a classroom and you can, there can be you know, a teacher in the front just telling you how it is and you're there taking notes or whatever. Or you can have a classroom that's broken up into small groups, you know, three or four, you know, and everybody talking and sharing. And so those are like social structures that it seems to me that can foster or diminish, you know, raise the level of empathy within society. So there is kind of like a social component to changing the social structures uh, to be, you know, more supportive of empathy. So, uh, and, and some people, you know, the human potential movement or whatever it was, you know, it's all in you, it's all there. But I think it seems to me, to me there's two parts to it, at least, I mean, there's more, but, and I try to kind of work with those too. So I'm just wondering what you think about that. Uh, I think what you're saying is true. And I also think what happens to some people is they see the social structures and they forget that it is people who are creating those social structures. And so it's easy to have an enemy image about some of the social structures in our world, like corporations, the school system, certainly it's easy to have enemy images about that, um, our leaders. And so I still think the answer is connecting, connecting with the people who are influential in those structures and helping them find uh, the possibility to be effective in their business and also connected to people. I think many of us think it's a choice. Either I'm efficient or I'm in NVC. Either I'm effective or I'm in NVC. And one of our goals with the NVC Academy was to really demonstrate that an organization can run efficiently and effectively and totally within the NVC consciousness. Those, thing, those three concepts do not, are not mutually exclusive. And I think what in our world, we need to spend more time helping business leaders and other influential people in our world understand that, that they can be as effective, possibly more effective, if they employ some of the NVC concepts. And I believe it's possible. Well, so th hmm. that's how I would oh, respond I see. to well, that. What I kind of got out of what you're saying is to see the social structures as not abstract somehow, but that there's people within those, that there is part of people. So, you know, you hear a lot of demonization of the government, you know, the government is bad, the government exactly. can't do anything, you know, mm -hmm. and then what we're really talking about is people. There, It's a group of, of people there and to abstract them into this, you know, this, image and you know of an, some enemy you know that um you know is is not maybe you know the best way of doing it and the same with corporations we you know there's this other people are saying oh corporations are bad corporations are evil or, or whatever so again that's the same thing and we want to you know see the humanity of, of the people you know working in, in these different uh environments mm -hmm. absolutely so I know you, you had a, another appointment, um, so probably should come bring it the discussion to a close. Is there something you feel that you'd like to talk about that hasn't been covered? I think I'd just like to say that um, to me, all the work that we do with NVC or any of the other work we do, counseling or 12-step programs or anything like that, what all of it does is help us remember what's already true, that we're all divine beings. And helping us to find some kind of way to approach other people and ourselves with some sense of uh, remembering about that. And that empathy, what empathy does is it helps us remember that in ourselves and in other people. But it doesn't change whether we remember it or not. The, divin the actual divinity doesn't change. Mm. So it's, it's like, but it does make it. It does make it more pleasant if we remember it, <laughs> and and we can shift gears uh, way faster if we remember it, ah. <laughs> and we can have a smoother ride uh -huh. and more and have more enjoyment in it. Okay, well, wonderful. So thank, you. thank you so much, uh, Mary, for you know spending this time with me and talking. I really enjoyed it, and hope we can you know continue the dialogue and 
um, we're going to be doing some panel discussion. So I'd invite you to uh, join a panel with us to uh, talk about this as well, and you know, keep the keep the dialogue going. Great, thank you, Edwin. I would enjoy that. Thank you very much. Okay, well, thank you so much, and I will talk to you soon. Okay, bye bye. See the world through other people's eyes. Now, empathy is a quality of character that can change the world.